I'm bringing you now an introduction to my original book, which of course was the biography of Grace Sparks entitled Blazing a Trail to Independence, published in 2014. Grace Sparks was a proud grand banker, par none, and interestingly, 2020 has been designated as come home year for that community, making this a good time to revisit the publication. As many will attest, Grace was equally a tireless advocate and cheerleader for her home province in general. I'll read now from the foreword written by Honorable Edward Roberts. And what a remarkable woman Grace was, and what a remarkable life she lived. The year she spent teaching in Twellingate taught her much about the reality of life in Newfoundland in the 1930s. Her fierce patriotism, putting Newfoundland first and foremost, developed into the wellspring of her public life. She fought against Confederation with all the strength and skill she possessed. But when that battle was lost, she fought just as hard to make the new province the place she believed it could be. These were the years, the 1950s, when Joseph Smallwood and his liberals came to dominate Newfoundland's public life. Grace spoke out against their failings and campaigned passionately against their policies. She had the courage to stand for election as a progressive conservative at a time when few did. Grace's later years were very good ones. She was laden with the honors she deserved, including honorary doctorate degrees from Mount Allison and Memorial Universities. She died in 2003 at age 95. Her life her work and her accomplishments, and above all, the spirit in which she approached them, stands as inspiration to those who share her love for Newfoundland. The book is a worthy tribute to her. And reading now from my own preface, her defining attitude, being avant-garde, like Panasonic Electronics, slightly ahead of her time. While Grace's privileged upbringing and formal education gave her a huge springboard from which to view our particular piece of geography, her passion, commitment, and style were unique, individual, and unforgettable. CBC's Pigeon Inlet series characterized her to good advantage in the role of Grandma Walcott. Grace presented this portrayal of bygone Newfoundland with purposeful, tender, loving care. While I share her interest in education, theater, sports, and politics, Grace leaves me behind in a cloud of dust, since I am only an armchair curler and a neophyte golfer. More than anything, her unofficial motto, there it is, go get it, inspires a Kipling-like attitude defined by the early Newfoundland settlers, Bob Bartlett, mountain climbers, and dare I say the Newfoundland explorer, and achievers in every realm. Indeed, aptitude and ambition can only take you so far. It is attitude that defines a person. In Grace Sparks' case, all three A's were merged into a dynamic five-foot lady whose independence, verve, and motivation were unique. I was blessed to receive from Mrs. Sparks' good friend, Noel Hutton, words written by Grace herself. Grace had traveled extensively by coastal boat with her father from a very young age. And she says, I remembered Will, the house where we boarded in Harbour Britain. When I was 16 and in Harbour Britain on the coastal boat on my coastal boat on my way to Mount Allison, I walked to the place and could identify the entrance to the house. I knocked on the door and the lady verified my memories. She still kept borders. Everybody in a small Newfoundland community needed a place to stay from time to time. Boarding houses all over the island were open to visitors. Hotels were unknown in the remote outports. And she continues, we were happy in our home. Such things as dresses and skirts and blouses for girls and pants, etc., for boys were not often available in the shops, so we learned to sew. My father had bought a foot machine for my mother, 
a white bran, which she had brought home from Boston in the 1800s. It was worn out by the time I began to learn. But Howard, my brother, uh, growing tired of turning the wheel of the new hand machine by hand to help mother hitch the wheel of the hand machine to the foot pedal so we could all sit down and pedal and learn to sew a fine seam. Mother arranged things so that all we did mostly was guide the needle in a straight line and follow her markings. This is very interesting and significant because Grace made most of her own clothes in, all through her lifetime, including the outfit which she wore when receiving her honorary degree of laws from Mount Allison University. It is difficult to choose an antidote to read among Grace Sparks' many activities and causes. She was committed to community theater. She excelled as a reporter, actress, political worker, Kiwanis volunteer, musician, university leader, and educator. Add to that seniors advocate, church leader, curler, golfer, single mother. Is your head spinning yet? Here is a glimpse now then of Grace's humorous character during her years as an English teacher at Prince of Wales Collegiate. Uh, this is a reminiscence by Gary Knoll, who became the learning resources teacher at the school. And I will read. On Teacher Appreciation Day in the late 60s, it was customary at PWC for a student to take over the class. In Grace's English class of the day, a young chap took over at the front while Grace moved to a seat in the back of class. As the class progressed, the teacher noticed a note being passed in the rear and in a move to garner respect, he insisted that the note's recipient read its contents aloud after a few seconds of hesitation, the boy complied. The note read, Who's that cute new girl sitting in the back of row three? Far from being outraged, Grace laughed along with her class, suggesting that the whole thing had been choreographed, but that was not the case, of course. Her contribution to the community is shown with major impact through two initiatives which live on. Number one. Grace Sparks House, an affordable housing for victims of domestic violence and emotional abuse, is found on the Buren Peninsula. It's a beacon of hope for communities there. And from the enclosed photo, you can appreciate some of their programming. Counseling and helping the disadvantaged back onto their feet is carrying on Grace's passion for social advocacy. Number two. Motor vessel Grace Sparks keeps Mrs. Sparks' name alive in provincial culture as it plies the waters between Burnside and St. Brendan's, servicing people like Grace who value their independence and traditional lifestyle. Twin, trim, blue, and white fairies had rolled down the launch pad in the Marystown shipyard in 2011 and were christened in March of that year. A government news release stated champagne flowed on the bows of, Newf of Newfoundland and Labrador's newest ferries today, the motor vessel Grace Sparks and the motor vessel Isaac, Hazel McIsaac, officially christened today in the waters at Cowhead near, near Marystown. Honorable Tom Henderson, Minister of Transportation and Works of the day, continued. Grace Sparks and Hazel McIsaac were through political pioneers and trailblazers for women in this province, and we honor them both today with the christening of their vessels. Louise Hickman, niece of the late great Spark, Grace Sparks, officially christened her vessel. My mother would be terribly pleased and extremely honored to have a vessel christened in her name, said Doris Cohen, daughter of Grace Sparks. My mother was a lifelong Newfoundlander and was devoted to her country of Newfoundland. I know she would be proud and humbled if she were alive today to see the vessel that carries her name. I want to thank you for this gracious tribute to a woman who gave so much to her community. Unable to resist an opportunity to sail 
on the motor vessel Grace Sparks. In mid-August of the inaugural year, my husband Carl and I traveled to Burnside, Bonavista Bay to experience the run. As motor vessel Grace Sparks approached the dock, it was time to reminisce about Grace Sparks' leg legacy, her love of coastal boats and outport connections. Here was her legacy, vessel plying the waves on the model of the Reed Alphabet fleet, which she loved so much. Another relative with fond memories of Aunt Grace is Clarence Patton, who also summarized their relationship. I never really saw much of her and never really got to know her until I went to Munn in 1961. I lived in her neighborhood on Hatcher Street for a couple of years and I was the same age as her daughter, Doris. So I did go see her occasionally. One year, I can't remember which one, my wife and I actually lived with her and Doris for a few months. I do remember one night, probably when I was in my late 20s. I went to visit Grace on the semi-chopped motorcycle which I had at the time. She was home alone, as was often the case. Doris was then living in Shoe Cove. Grace said that she would love to pay Doris a visit. And when I told her that I was on my cycle, but that we could go in her car, she opted to go on the cycle with me. It was quite a sight for Doris to see her mom, helmet and all, with her dress hiked up around her knees, pull into the Shoe Cove driveway well after dark. Doris takes over the narrative at this point. When mother arrived, she heard Ken Ken dance music coming from our stereo. Taking her cue from it, she danced in, giving Ken Ken kicks and still wearing her heavy helmet. Clarence continued, we all had a pretty good laugh about it all and Grace thoroughly enjoyed the experience. This is a book for those who like to delve into history, for political junkies, for Newfoundland patriots, for those who wish to instill equality between the sexes, and for everyone needing inspiration to overcome adversity, certainly now as we face our current challenges of isolation and uncertainty. Again, thank you for listening.